welcome, welcome. Lovely to see you all. My name is Julia Slay. I'm one of the team delivering this session. I'm really excited to have you here in our um, focus today on procurement and spend as a lever for change in anchor institutions. We've got a great lineup of speakers for you today. I'm really, really excited about the range of perspectives we're bringing together. As I said, my name's Julia. I'm hosting this session and I'm a senior associate at the Innovation Unit and a freelance consultant. And I've been helping to um, design and run some of the events we're having this week. We've got Alex Hammond from NHS England and Improvement, who's the head of sustainable procurement and supply chain. Uh, she's going to be talking to us about some of the national perspective and some of the kind of upcoming policy agenda in this space. We've got Zach Newen, who is a senior buyer at the East London Foundation Trust. Really excited about hearing about some of the work they've been doing on social value. Um, I've been closely connected to it before, and I think it's, it's some of the most exciting work I've seen. So super, super excited that we can bring that to you today. And we've got um, Beth Pilgrim, who's been doing some amazing work both in and out of health. Um, Beth is from Supply Change and working um, with social enterprises, um, getting them into the supply chain. So some really wonderful perspectives, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, kind of uh, examples to bring to you today. And we're, we're gonna have a short presentation from each of those speakers and then plenty of time for Q&A. So I know that many of you will have things you wanna ask and, uh, and, and interact with and we'll tell you about how you can do that in a moment. We are recording this session for those uh, who can't be here today to make sure that the resource is available and we will be sharing out the slides afterwards in case any of you were wondering that. It's lovely to see some of your faces so great if you can keep your cameras on if you're comfortable with that. Um, and we are using Slido to uh, gather questions, your reflections, your examples. Um, and Gweno has just added, sorry, yes, that's a typo. Gweno has just added the instructions for logging on to Slido in the chat. So that is slido.com. And if you enter the code HOUN3, you'll see that the Q&A will be open throughout and there's a couple of polls for you to fill in. So please do open that up now, take a moment to open up a browser and head in, into Slido. Um, really, really keen to hear from all of you today. I know lots of you are doing some really exciting work in practice and we wanna make sure we get the chance to capture and share that learning. Okay, let's move on. So what is an anchor institution? I know many of you know this already. So really this is just um, a kind of quick recap for those who are slightly newer to the topic because we've got a real range of, um, of kind of people and perspectives here today. Uh, we've been talking about them as large, generally public sector or not-for-profit institutions rooted in place. Um, and they really are connected to that particular community or geography. So they have got often either significant physical assets um, uh, or they maybe are delivering services in a particular geography um, or a coterminous with something, you know, like a local authority. So classic examples would be uh, hospitals, NHS trusts, local authorities, housing associations. Um, and the, kind of the, one of the key differentials is that they are often one of the biggest employers and spenders. So they have real economic power and they can use that economic power much more intentionally to um, reduce health inequalities, tackle poor determinants of health um, and benefit the local community. So that's just a quick uh, one moment on kind of what it is we're talking today, talking about today. Okay, Gweno, if we could move on. Okay, brilliant. So some of you have already started to fill out the first poll on Slido, which is great. For those of you who've just joined or haven't had a chance to look at that yet, I'll give you a moment to hop on there. So we wanted to ask you, which of the following topics are you most interested in exploring? And this is fascinating, actually. So um, a lot of people interested in assessing and measuring social value. Quite a few of you um, looking at monitoring social value and managing delivery within contracts identifying priority groups to benefit from procurement. I know Zach is gonna talk about this and I think this is a really um, you know, important area of focus for many people is trying to work out where they want that social value to benefit, who they want it to benefit or which part of a, a town or a city or a region they want it to benefit. Um, it's changing in front of our eyes, isn't it? So there's obviously a lot of interest across the whole piece today, but then there's also quite a lot of interest in training, capacity building and leadership. 
Um, and then also a fair bit of interest. I mean, we're pretty, we're pretty much at the fifties and forties for all of them. So I think probably between our speakers, I'm hoping we'll be able to cover off quite a lot of that. We've got supplier engagement and market testing and also developing better data on current spending. Um, so yeah, pretty even across a lot of those actually interesting. The top three at the moment, looking like that kind of assessing and measuring point, monitoring and managing that through contracts and the internal training, capacity building and leadership. Fab. Gweno, and then we have one more question for you, which is, is there anything we haven't mentioned? So is there anything else that we haven't mentioned in those categories that you really want to explore in relation to procurement and spending as an anchor strategy? So if there's anything we haven't already talked about that you think is a real burning question that you're holding on to or something that you really, you're really keen to explore, feel free to add it in there. Give you a minute just to do that. And then we'll go straight into the presentations. So interesting. So major construction projects, how those can be used. Yeah. Collaboration with other anchors, planning with other anchors. That's come up a lot this week, the kind of working in partnership um, and how to do that. Great, really, really good point. And some of you may be part of um, anchor networks or anchor collaboratives. So some cities and regions are starting to form networks of anchors who are collaborating together, but not everywhere has that. So there's a kind of partnership collaboration infrastructure that varies depending on the place. Involving the local community, absolutely brilliant. That's come up a lot. Influencing NHS supply chain. Uh, influencing local food procurement as part of social value. Great, that's a really interesting one. Um, and thinking about NHS organizations and charities and working across the ICS. Great, do keep adding on to that. We can keep an eye on that and it's really helpful for us to um, hold in mind as we move into the Q&A and for the speakers to have a chance to see the kind of questions that are on your mind. But for now, we're gonna move on. So Gweno, Fab, thank you so much. So we're gonna kick off with Alex. Um, Alex, I'm gonna hand over to you and let you take it away. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thanks everyone. It's lovely to see some people here and, um, and to have a chance to introduce myself. Um, some of you may know me from previous uh, work um, uh, at Guys and St. Thomas's and at ETL. Um, I've recently joined NHS um, England and NHS Improvement, leading on uh, sustainable procurement and supply chain. So big, big agenda here. Um, and I just want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing. Um, uh, if we can move on to the first slide, that would be fab. So this is just a bit of context here. Um, what we, you may be aware, I imagine you are if you're on this call, um, that the NHS published a delivering net zero health service um, report back in October. And this really set out some of our, the, the pathway for our work and, um, and, and had a, you know, some really uh, clear targets and big commitments around what we're gonna do. So we will be net zero uh, supply chain by 2045, um, we will, um, by the end of the decade, we will no longer work with suppliers who do not align to or exceed our net zero ambitions. Um, and these are these are exciting and, and, and big commitments. This is a bit about how we intend to get there. So um, within our program, we are looking at net zero, um, but we also are looking at um, uh, stamping out modern slavery and um, how we integrate social value. Now we appreciate social value incorporates climate change. Um, but we, you know, there's some other really important things around social value, um, you know, um, tackling inequalities um, and social exclusion, uh, well-being, that kind of thing. So um, our, our program covers all three of these issues. It's not just a net zero program. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. Now I won't go into all of this because this is kind of a big, big, busy slide, but essentially our vision is that by 2045, we see an NHS with a net zero fair and transparent supply chain free of modern slavery. And this is our work plan, it's how we're gonna get there. So we have three strategic objectives. We're gonna be working with suppliers. We're gonna be working internally with an NHS improvement in England to make sure that we are giving the right guidance and support to the, to the system. And we'll also be working with trusts and ICSs to roll this, these, these, these programs out. So we are developing some, what we're calling playbooks, basically 
guidance, um, uh, but, but hopefully guidance that provides really good information, breaks down all the barriers um, for things like uh, walking aid reuse or device reprocessing, medical device reprocessing, so that at a trust level, you can start rolling these things out um, with, you know, with confidence. Next slide, please. Um, some of you who are, are uh, big studiers of, of the, the NHS report might recognize this, this graph. Um, this is, these are the 13 things, the 13 interventions that we've identified we need to do in order to get our supply chain to net zero. So at the bottom, the blue line shows where we are at the moment, um, uh, far too much. Um, and and the, the green bits and uh, yellow bits show where we can, we can make a, a big difference. So you'll see in there things like process and product innovation so that you're know, working with our supply chain um, to help them help us. To, to improve the way that we do things. But also, you know, we, we have things in there like um, reducing single use plastics. You know, that has an environmental impact, certainly on wildlife, et cetera, but it also has a you know, carbon impact. Uh, metal instrument reprocessing, device reuse, all of these things. So, um, you know, we've got a lot of things to, to, to get to work on. Um, and uh, and we will be talking lots more about this um, much more openly in the public uh, domain um, in, in the next few months. Next slide, please. Don't worry, I won't quiz you on this one, nor will I um, expect you to be able to read it all because it's all quite small. But this is our work plan. This is our five-year work plan. It's just really to show the scale and the scope of what we're trying to do. You know, this is a, the, the I've worked in the NHS now for uh, nearly 12 years and sustainable procurement has always been that, you know, that kind of, uh, Hard to hard to do thing got put in the too hard box, and um, what we're trying to do as a team within NHS England and improvement is take it out of the hard to do box and put it into the easy to do box. Make it really clear, make it really um, uh, easy to 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 participate with and um, and support our our suppliers to support us. So that's what this is. This slide is all about. Next one, slide, please. Brilliant. So social value, this is really our topic of today. And I and what I, um, I will just go over really quickly now. I think those of you who are on this call are probably well aware of, of what social value includes. But um, just as a reminder, these are sort of the five pillars of social value as defined by UK government. Um, so tackling economic inequality, fighting climate change, um, supporting uh, COVID-19 recovery. I would like that to say a green COVID-19 recovery, but it doesn't. So. Um, uh, well-being and equal opportunity. So we at NHS England and Improvement have been incorporating social value into our tenders over the last few months. As of the 1st of April, it's mandatory to go into every single tender that a minimum weighting of 10% on every single tender um, uh, needs to be uh, on some form of social value. And, um, and this is a process we're going through. Um, it's, it has varying levels of success, but we're really trying to test it out within the commercial team at NHS England and Improvement to make sure that we get it right before we make it mandatory across the system. The intention is, is that it will be mandatory, the minimum 10% weighting on social value will be mandatory from the 1st of April, 2022 for NHS organizations. Um, great, um, moving on. So we are using, we're, we're, we're blatantly um, <laughs> uh, aligning to the government standards. We don't want to create a whole new, a whole new process of, of addressing this. So we're, we're, we're um, uh, aligning to the um, procurement policy note that was published in June last year um, to, uh, by central government. We, um, we are looking to, however, understand what health needs specifically within social value and how we can how we can align to that. So we've got some workshops coming up in um, in May and in June uh, to, to, to really hash that out with stakeholders um, and NHS uh, procurement people who, who you know, and, and not just procurement, we want to understand for everyone what we think needs to be in there for specifically to health. Um, moving on to the next slide, please. Just one, one or two minutes to go, Alex. Perfect, this is my last slide. So, um, 
the uh the, just as i mentioned we've got some um workshops some social value health module workshops to 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 um clarify that in may and june um over the summer of 2021 we will be engaging with our supply chain um more um sort of more formally not not in a formal consultation but more in a sort of you know getting their feedback on our plan um, understanding where they are and whether they're prepared to, to um, support us, what they, where there there might be some gaps in their skill set, um, and uh, obviously in November twenty one we've got to COP twenty six, so that's another preparation. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so the workshops are are for NHS people, but if you if you're keen to um, to attend, let me know. Um, my I think if you move to the next slide, Gwen, it's my last slide. It's got my email address on there. Please let me know if you'd like to attend, and um, and we'll have a look. I mean, we've we we want the, the the workshops to be small enough that they can be collaborative, um, but we are also keen to involve as many people as possible. So please do let us know if you'd be like to join. Thank you so much, Alex. That was a tour de force, and there's a huge amount in there, which is brilliant. Um, just a reminder: please do add any questions that are coming up for you onto the Slido. Um, we can make sure that we come to them at the end. We can hear from all of the panelists. I am going to bring in Zach next um, to tell us a little bit about the work that um, they have been doing at Elft on social value. So Zach, over to you. Uh, no, thank you. And really glad to see everyone and really wanting to share our journey with social value and how we integrated that into the procurement function at East London. So just a brief introduction. Um, so uh, since last year, about October 2020, we've been looking into social value uh, and working to incorporate into ELF as we become an anchor and really leading some of the good work around our local communities and also targeting priority groups. So for us, we engage with various stakeholders and developed our own group to really identify key priorities that we think we want to tackle and achieve at our organization. And it's really trying to trans, um, translate these priorities and integrate into our frameworks so that when we do go into the contract management, the good work doesn't get lost and it actually improves. So based on various meetings, we've actually uh, determined the main priorities that we have. The key first one is real living wage, which is currently integrated in all our procurement processes where we require that the suppliers must comply uh, we also are encouraging creation of equal work opportunities and training opportunities for local people, uh, people with protected characteristics as per the Inequality Act, and also groups that were hardest hit by COVID pandemic last year and currently at the moment as well, supporting young workers and getting them into the workforce, investing, but also retending, um, keeping retention of um, money spent in local economies and then finally, commitment to sustainability and also a target to reduce carbon emission. Now, these are all great. However, we've done some assessment and it has been a challenge uh, in our organization to identify um, metrics and have a baseline to actually work on and improve. So we've been looking a lot about our contract management and uh, reviewing our contracts. We were identifying which contractors actually provide and do pay their staff the real living wage and work compliant. And it's been a negotiation for the last couple of months and until now working with them and supporting them to actually uh, have some fair pay for their workers. Another thing um, that has also been looked at our organization is the amount of spend. So I've been doing a lot of work with um, various networks for Anchor and um, part of that is identifying the various spend that we have across our organization. Now, this is uh, for ELF, but to transcend to other groups, uh, it could be a tiered approach. Something that we are uh, doing at the moment is having tiers. So immediate would be East London catchment and then expanding further into the North East London catchment and potentially Greater London. So this is just an example of what we've been uh, facing with our current um, spend. So those were the very easy baselines that we were able to identify. Some of the struggles and hurdles that we've actually come to grasp during our um, journey with the procurement process is identification and defining lo uh, locality. Um, having it, should it be more specific into various regions and some might say ward. So for example, Limehouse within the Tower Hamlets area, um, or does it become more broad and more um, general, such as London, uh, for our case, East London. 
So I was really identifying that and really following through with that um, kind of definition. The clarity on the priority groups, uh, this will depend on various organizations, but we decided to go with the protected characteristics as per the Inequalities Act. But in, as a mental health organization, we identified that there are other uh, aspects that we really needed to explore, which is service users, which is very important and key to our organization. Some of the questions that we do go out to tender, so now this is our proposals and it's trying to be compliant with the procurement regulations is record only. Now it's a bit bizarre to go out and ask suppliers to ask record only questions and not have them be assessed on it. But the benefit of this is that we're really trying to draw out KPIs to really encourage social value and um, delivering that in the contract management. I think that's a very key and missed opportunity with some organizations and they can really drive extra social value in the contract management and not just at the predetermined procurement stage. So an example would be a, a set amount of percentage of women workers and BAME workers. Um, now this, I might not be assessing as a score to determine the award. However, this would be something I'd have as a KPI and working as an anchor on an organization to support the supplier to maintain and improve that kind of metric and level. Uh, qualitative processes uh, questions. So it might be strategies and plans and how they engage with various uh, groups. Um, one example would be having an equal pay strategy for women. Uh, metrics that are compliant with the procurement regulation is also another hurdle and some organizations and procurement teams I've discussed have also faced concerns as well. You can't really place favoritism or having a disadvantage for supply just because they can't I meet a metric, we're trying to be fair and equitable, which is always part of the procurement process. And then finally, it's a challenge um, for certain organizations, particularly the small uh, voluntary sector and also small medium enterprises. Um, it can be a burden to actually do the monitoring and measuring these figures such as the carbon emission and also another aspect which um, has come based on that various supply engagements we've conducted. Um, measurement of their protected characteristic workers. It's um, not ethical, or sometimes not ever measured. Um, so it's very um, coming up to light that there are challenges regarding some of the measurements. So what does it all mean? This actually feeds into something which is a wider picture. So there's a Northeast L London Charter that's currently in discussion. So this is an agreement with 14 organizations that have signed up. So it's including local authorities and NHS. And the idea is to work on a framework that really self assess and identifies um, four main priorities. So one is how much your social values have been integrated into your procurement, maybe 5% and maybe 15%. So the higher it is, the better you score uh, as an organization and feeding into the Northeast London Charter. Um, also the percentage of your suppliers that are compliant with the real living wage, um, local uh, based suppliers within our Northeast London postcodes and also the amount of supplies that are small medium enterprises and this might expand further to uh, voluntary sector. Now this is my last slide so what we're the current back. stage is oh, no worries. the current uh, status is that we've at least have a baseline of what we want to measure and what we want to go out. So at the moment, we're actually going through quite a few tenders and we're really using this as a test and seeing and having real life uh, implications and having real life um, evidence of how it works in the real world and the procurement. Also, another thing is that it's not a one, uh, one stop um, shop or it's not a one glove fits all. This is really has to be bespoke to uh, different different um, categories. So IT, estates, digital, um, all completely different. So it's always having a set of core objectives and core metrics, but also tailoring it and bespoking to the type of um, market that we're going to. Um, having the resource implications is a big thing. And I mentioned a lot about the contract management, but it's really important to have that contract management within the social value. Otherwise you lose that kind of a work that has been planned out and it gets lost. And finally, it's a, a in discussion at the moment, but the long-term aspirations and what we want to achieve, uh, do we wanna have 50% of women? Um, do we wanna have increase in BMAE? This is all up for discussion, but really identifying uh, our strategies for the next five years and what we wanna achieve from it all. Thank you.
Fab. Thank you so much, Zach. That was a really, really interesting uh, look into the work that you have been doing. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about that. Um, at the moment, all is quiet. Oh, there's one question coming on the Slido. So do head on over there if you've got any questions that have just come up from the first two presentations. Um, be great to see those coming through. And now we're going to move on to our third speaker, um, Beth Pilgrim, so bringing in uh, kind of more of the supplier perspective, uh, which is often missing from these discussions, I find so really excited that we can have Beth here today. Uh, Beth, over to you. Hi, thanks, Julia. Um, first slide, please, Greno. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Beth from Supply Change. Um, Supply Change was founded in 2018 by myself and my co-founders, Isha and Barina. Our mission is to create a world where goods and services are commissioned with social and environmental value at their centre by increasing the number of social enterprises in public and private sector supply chains. So today I'm going to talk about how engaging with social enterprises in your supply chain can help anchor institutions deliver social value to communities through their spend and some practical steps on how anchors can start to embed social procurement across their organisations. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm sure many of you do know, but for those that don't, social enterprises operate like any other business, uh, delivering goods and services to customers and making a profit. But crucially, these profits are reinvested back into a social or environmental mission at their heart. From providing jobs and training opportunities to protecting our natural world through innovative, sustainable practices, Social enterprises are at the forefront of delivering positive change that we so desperately need. And throughout the pandemic, they've shown their resilience and flexibility to support communities while still delivering great services. Next slide, please. There's a vast and still largely untapped potential in supporting these businesses through private and public sector procurement. Procurement done right, is one of the greatest tools that we have with which to build social value into the fabric of society. And it has the power to create real lasting social and environmental change. When you directly procure from social enterprises, you can generate benef benefits to communities, but also to your own organizations. So to society, social enterprises lead to job creation. Many operate with environmental practices to so support climate change support local economic growth and investing in communities, but also for anchors, it can help you meet your own internal social value objectives, help with responsible sourcing, introduce diversity and innovation into your supply chain, which the last year has shown us the importance of. And it can also really help to engage your staff um, and retain them as well. Next slide, please. Uh, as well as being the right thing to do, there is now added incentive for public sector organisations to embrace social procurement, which Alex touched on earlier. Uh, from the 1st of January this year, the social procurement landscape has been improved by a new government model, the social value model. This series of new measures represents a positive step forward by the government as it mandates the assessment of social impact made by suppliers to public bodies. Uh, this change, this, the changes will apply to all central government departments, so the Cabinet Office, Department of Health and Social Care, executive agencies and non-departmental public bodies. According to the new procurement policy note uh, on the new model, which was published in September, social value must now be explicitly evaluated in all central government contracts. Um, and whereas previously it was just considered as currently required under the Public Services Social Value Act in 2012. So although this change of wording might sound minor, it actually highlights a big shift in the government's approach to social value. Um, whereas previously officials were required to think about social value within procurement processes, there was nothing to ensure that it was a determining factor. But the new model insists that social value is explicitly evaluated. And the framework is imposing a minimum weighting of 10% for social value in decisions on contract bids. So this means that social value will soon be a standardised compulsory aspect of government procurement. And that could make a decisive difference when there's close competition. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the practical next steps that anchors can take to introduce more social enterprises into their supply chains? 
Embedding social procurement within your organization is not an overnight process and requires a considered approach. However, we recommend starting with these simple steps. Firstly, carry out an opportunity analysis of your spend data. So carrying out data analysis of your current contracts and spending is a great way for anchor institutions to establish a baseline of where to work from in terms of social procurement, like Zach mentioned. Data analysis met methods can show anchors if you are already working with social enterprises, they can identify spending categories which are suitable to switch to social suppliers and identify areas of spending that are leaking out of the local economy. Looking at spend data across a group of anchors can also show where spending power of different organizations could be com combined to create further market opportunities for social enterprises. Secondly, start with small switches. After the, this analysis, anchors can then start by identifying smaller procurement needs within your supply chain that are easy to switch. Some common areas to start introducing social enterprises might include tea and coffee, uh, printed materials, stationery, or catering. There are so many social enterprises providing these easy to switch goods that are making an impact at the same time, making for really quick wins. And thirdly, use progressive procurement strategies. So after choosing which areas of your supply chain you would like to introduce social enterprises to, progressive procurement strategies can help boost social enterprises access to supply chains, leading to increased revenue and greater sustainability. Some strategies that could be used are an increase in the minimum social value weighting of tenders to encourage applications from social enterprise sector. This is particularly useful for tenders where social enterprises might face steep competition from commercial suppliers. And ensuring transparency of contracts by offering pre-market engagement activities to social enterprises, such as meet the buyer events, can also help to ensure social enterprises access to anchor supply chains. And fourthly, uh, and finally, anchors can also ask their current contractors to examine their own supply chains to find space to subcontract to social enterprises. Most organizations need goods and services like catering, cleaning, stationery, for example, all things which can be procured from social enterprises. Giving each of your primary contractors a target of introducing one to two social examples as social enterprises, for example, is a great place to start. Next slide, please. Just so, a minute left, Beth. I think you're almost there anyway, aren't you? Yeah. So at Supply Change, we work with both public and private sector organisations and social enterprises to remove the barriers to social procurement and create meaningful impact. So for buyers, we offer a range of services to make buying from social enterprises easier, safer and quicker. Our spend analysis services help identify areas of opportunity in existing spending to switch to social suppliers. Our policy and reporting support, support helps to embed social procurement in organizational targets and track their impact. We run virtual networking events to connect buyers directly with social enterprises and raise awareness and internal support. And finally, we have the supply change platform which is a directory of pre-vetted social enterprises that buyers can browse and find suppliers who will deliver quality and a positive impact. Um, so please get in touch if you would like to find out any more about our services, but that's me. Uh, thank you so much, Beth. Some really interesting food for thought there. And we have uh, plenty of questions actually now coming through on the Slido, and I think if you haven't used Slido before, one thing that's quite helpful is you can upvote other people's questions. So I can see that there has been some upvoting going on. And so I'm gonna start at the top and kind of work my way down. And the first one, um, I might come to you first, Alex, but others might have, might, might have some thoughts about this too, which is about kind of how do we reconcile the drive for more centralized national procurement to reduce costs against local procurement? Um, yeah, do you want to kick us off and then and then Zach or Beth feel free to hop in if you want to add on. I think there's a there's a balance that we need to strike isn't there, I mean it feels like we've. There's opportunities where we can centralize procurement to make them more sustainable and make the sustainable option easier. So um, uh, fleet cars, for example, comes to mind. You know, if we were to if we were to create a, a sort of centralized procurement for 
um, for zero emission cars and fleet for, for NHS trust to just sort of buy into. They just, they don't have to do a procurement themselves. They can just use that procurement. Then that is, you know, that can help help deliver low emission or zero emission vehicles across the country faster. Um, I do appreciate we have um, a, you know, there's a pressure, there's pressure on trusts and, and ICS leads to, to centralize their procurement. And uh, there was a question earlier around um, SCCL or supply chain or mention of that in terms of the, um, uh, the you know, the, the the issues that, that need to be addressed. We work very closely with supply chain sustainability team to make sure that the this the work that we're doing is also integrated into the work that they are doing. They're they're they've been doing this for a long time. There's a lot of good work that's happening in supply chain. So, you know, we not everything's going to be local. I have to say. I mean that that will that will be the case. Um, I, more should be local and more should be social enterprise. Um, uh, but I think we, you know, it's, it's our job to find the balance between those two things and, and, and capitalize on where we are centralizing procurement, making those things, you know, getting the big wins in there. Um, and, and then also, you know, looking at what we can do on a local level as well. Thanks, Alex. Uh, feel free to hop in Beth or Zach, if you want to, otherwise I will move us on. Okay. Let's, let's move on. There's another question coming up, which is, um, uh, around kind of advice that you might have for getting buy-in across your organization and or across multiple anchor institutions. So what has been your experience about what's worked really in terms of getting buy-in? Um, Zach, I might come to you first because I know you've had some interesting conversations with your board about this and they're very invested and, and supportive. And also you've been working across the Northeast London patch and also in the City and Hackney network. So you've seen kind of different uh, scales of this, I suppose. So yeah, any reflections from you on what works to get buy-in? No, that's a very interesting point. Um, I think what it really comes down to is having a bit of a sponsor or a big executive um, person to actually just push and drive. Um, I guess in the case of my organization, we've had a lot of discussions about social value and ELF being an anchor. And it's, it's one of the highest priority agendas, if not the highest of our organizations. Um, how we would kind of collaborate with other organizations, it's a complete matter and that's out of my scope of responsibility. But I guess what it comes down to is it's really starting the dialogue. Just, I, know, I trust organizations um, might not be able to start now, but at least having that kind of discussion, opening the dialogue, and it might not be now, but in the next year or so, um, it opens up and it starts being a bigger priority. Mm. Great. Alex or Beth, did you want to come in on, on what you've seen or learned from your work with anchors? I think um, it's about building a bit of a case for support. Um, certainly in um, our experience, when you're um, convincing people of the benefits of social enterprise, um, I agree it takes sort of having a, 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 an internal champion who is of a kind of senior standing. But I also think it takes sort of building that picture um, with things like showing, you know, spend analysis and showing what the opportunities are. Um, with pre-market engagement activities, which allow your kind of staff to, to meet uh, local suppliers or social suppliers and learn a bit more about what they do and kind of get engaged with them um, to just sort of slowly build that culture of social procurement and get people to kind of just be more aware of it um, and educated about it. So I think it's it requires a sort of multi-pronged um, approach, really, and um, Kind of not just uh, talking about oh, but it's a good thing to do, but actually sort of stating the evidence and showing why it's kind of beneficial for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. And certainly, oh, sorry, Alex, come on in. I was I, all I was going to say is I, I completely agree with with Beth on that. I think one of the things that we are. Um, you know, we can mandate social value and we will, we are mandating it um, in the NHS, but it's, it's about making it real for people. You know, I think that's what, I think a lot of people look at it as like, oh God, so how are we going to do the social value thing, you know, but they might already be doing it. You know, they might already be asking the right questions and, and not even realize it. Um, I, I, and it really, 
um, lovely example of um, that came up yesterday. Um, uh, I think I can say who it was. I think well, I won't say it. it's a grocery store um, that is working with um, UK victims of, of modern slavery, and um, and helping them to uh, rehabilitate, but also giving them jobs. And you know, this is this is something that's real. These are people who have experienced, you know, terrible conditions, and this is a supplier that is saying to uh or a company that is saying to um to to its board you know we're not going to just sort of pay lip service to social value we're actually going to you know find these find people who have been victims of social of modern slavery give them roles within our our um our stores and and train them up and give and bring them back into into society and give them the tools they need to succeed and i think when you start talking about social value as real people it becomes so much more alive than if it's just, I mean, we have to, we have to be careful. We don't sort of get into this, like, oh, you know, you must do this thing. Um, but, but also, you know, it won't be an option not to. So it's about kind of getting the combination of those two things. Thanks. Mm. Well, yeah. And just to build on that, because I think the thing that my mind meant to went to with that, this question was finding opportunities to actually just test and learn and do the work. So there's a a small network of anchor organizations that I've been working with in City and Hackney, including the hospital, the local authority, the East London Foundation Trust. Um, and one of the things we, we started to do was to kind of map the procurement pipeline and look at where there were opportunities to collaborate as a network. And catering and concessions has come up as one area where there's a bit of appetite to do some work together. Now, this isn't about, it's not about a joint procurement exercise, but there will be some joint supplier engagement because actually the timelines for those contracts going out are similar enough and the potential suppliers are similar enough that it makes sense to do that together and there's a real appetite to engage and support local suppliers um, in, in those contracts. So that's a kind of, I guess for me, there's definitely something about what is the opportunity you've got to apply this work and to kind of test and learn as you go. Um, I also really agree with the sponsor point. I think um, in many anchor organizations that we've seen who, who really champion this agenda, there is someone equivalent to a kind of executive director or deputy chief executive who covers the kind of commercial services or corporate services, who's really the sponsor for this. And that makes a huge difference. Um, okay, so just moving on down the questions, there is a nice one here, Beth, I'm going to come to you, but again, others um, may have thoughts on this, which is around what are some of the barriers that social enterprises face that would be kind of quick wins to tackle or remove? So what are some of the kind of obvious own goals that anchors might be doing? Um, yeah, great question. Um, well, there's unfortunately, there's a lot of different barriers why social enterprises struggle to access public sector contracts. But I guess one of the ones that comes up repeatedly is around accessibility and visibility of opportunities. So actually knowing what contracts are out there um, that they might be suitable for. Um, and often within anchor institutions, there is a kind of long tail of lower, smaller value spending which might not be advertised publicly through portals, which actually smaller businesses and social enterprises are really suited to. Um, and these might also be contracts where the procurement processes are, are quicker and they are quicker wins and they're easier to switch. Um, so that's why we'd recommend kind of looking at that smaller, lower value spend um, and engaging with social enterprises on those opportunities. So whether that's through um, running pre-market engagement activities, whether that's through um, uh, using platforms like Supply Change to find social enterprises and invite them to quote, um, just being more transparent about what um, spending opportunities are out there, um, because, you know, we're aware that there are obviously large contracts that some social enterprises might not be able to deliver against, but there may be subcontracting opportunities, like I mentioned, um, and smaller opportunities that are just getting missed. Um, so I'd really encourage um, anchors to look at, at that um, level of spending and see where they can redirect it towards local and social suppliers. Thank you, Beth. Uh, uh, we have somehow raced through the time and we are at time for the end of part one. And I know there's some more questions in there, particularly some more detailed questions. Um, Zach, I know there's a couple for you in there, but I think you're staying on for our part two. And I think some of the others who, who, who have been asking those questions are, are too. Some of you will have to leave us now, I know, and I know some of you are staying on for part two. If you can do stay, I think it'll be a really rich discussion and we're gonna move into some of this more detailed 
practical examples. Those of you who are leaving us, please do share some um, feedback in the chat, insights or actions that you are leaving with today. Those of you who are staying, we'll be diving into some more detail. A massive thank you to our presenters. You've been absolutely wonderful. And there are so many other questions I wish we could have we could have asked you, but hopefully there will be future opportunities to bring you back in and, and hear more from you. I'm sure there will be. So a massive thank you to you. I know Zach and Alex, you're staying on with us, which is great. So um, thank you, those of you who are heading off. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. I hope you have a great end to the week. And those of you who are staying, feel free to grab a cup of tea and coffee and then come back and we will kick off at 25 past sharp.